Welcome back anatomy students. Today we want to talk about the respiratory system. As with any system, our objectives are basically to identify the pieces and parts and what they do. First, let's go through the list of all of the structures in the respiratory system and then later we'll talk about what what the purpose of each of them is. So the respiratory system is basically divided into a conducting zone, so the movement of air from outside to inside, and a respiratory zone, and that would be the exchange of gases. So starting with your nose, you should be able to trace the pathway of an oxygen molecule from outside the body until it reaches your bloodstream. So this would be your pathway. So it's gonna enter through the nose, move through the pharynx, which is your throat, the larynx, which is your voice box, and there it has to pass through the epiglottis and glottis, the trachea, which is your windpipe, and then the bronchides, which branch into bronchioles, and that's all inside of the lungs. So that's the conducting zone, just moving air from outside of the body into the inside. So when you get to the bottom of the bronchi, they branch into bronchioles, and at the very end of those, you have the respiratory bronchioles. Respiratory bronchioles are directly connected to alveoli, which are air sacs, and that's where gas exchange takes place. Let's talk a little bit more about the nose. So first of all, the openings of the nose are called the, the external nares, and then the external nares um, open up into the nasal passageways. The nasal cavity is divided by a nasal septum, so this um, wall that goes right down the middle there. Um, the inside of your nose is lined with mucosal membranes, so that provides moisture to the air that you breathe. It's also a sticky substance, so it's gonna capture uh, dirt and, and bacteria. Um, blood vessels are very close to the surface in your nose. That warms the air that you breathe in. Unfortunately, having vessels close to the surface makes it so that noses bleed rather easily, especially during the winter. Those um, capillaries close to the surface will dry out, they crack, and they create um, bleeding. Some special features, the mucus is there to trap um, the bacteria as well as other debris. And then we're lined with ciliated cells. So cilia are like little tiny hairs. So um, they're going to be sweeping things back, backwards, posteriorly, towards your throat. So dirt um, or bacteria, other particles that we don't want to enter into our lungs will be captured in the mucus and swept backwards by the cilia, enters your throat and then down into your stomach where they will be digested by stomach juices. In the winter, you might notice you get a runny nose just for no reason, it's not because you have a cold. When you're outside, those cilia, they become paralyzed and so they're no longer sweeping backwards so that moisture that your nose is creating is now coming forward. And that's why we get a runny nose out of nowhere. We also have three concha. You might remember this from the skeletal system. You have a superior, middle, and inferior concha, which are scroll-like bones, and they create a circulation of air. So they make sure that air comes into contact with the mucous membranes uh, for moistening and the capillaries for warming. So you can see um, the, the concha there in that picture. The pharynx is your throat. It has uh, three regions. You have your nasal pharynx up here in your nose, the oral pharynx down here in your um, tongue area, and then what we typically think of, a, of as our pharynx is our throat, the laryngopharynx, thinking of larynx. So any way you look at it, the pharynx is considered the throat. It's shared by both the digestive and the respiratory system. So notice you have an opening that connects both your nose and your mouth. So food you eat will follow through the esophagus. The air you breathe will follow through to the trachea. The pharynx is kind of cool. It allows humans to either breathe from their mouth or their nose. So that's really helpful. Um, also connected to the pharynx, into the nasal pharynx, is the auditory tube, the eustachian tube. It runs diagonally from the middle ear. So this allows for um, equalizing of air pressure on the eardrum. So you might notice you yawn to release or open, cause that to pop. You might have felt squeezes when you've gone diving a little bit too deep or um, or when you were up in the air and then maybe you chewed gum or swallowed 
um, to try to clear that, to open up that air passage. You also have tonsils and other lymph nodes in your pharynx area. So tonsils, um, they capture bacteria. There's white blood cells that are there. They're supposed to filter the plasma that's moving through, lymph that's moving through. Um, and so they can become inflamed when they are infected. Moving from the pharynx, you would enter into the larynx next. First, you have to pass through the epiglottis and glottis. So this is where your larynx would be located, below the pharynx, under the hyoid bone. You might remember that from the skeletal system, the only bone not connected to any other bone, and at the root of your tongue. So it's often called the Adam's apple or the voice box. So this is the larynx. There's lots of cartilage pieces to it. This one up front, this is called the thyroid cartilage, and that's actually the piece that protrudes in the neck region that you identify as the Adam's apple. So it plays a role in speech. As air moves through um, the larynx, it'll pass through your vocal cords, these flaps, um, and the movement of the vocal cords creates sound. So you might hear it coming out, you might hear it going in. So this is a picture of um, vocal cords abducted, separated, and this is a picture of the vocal cords adducted, put together. Um, we have to pass through the glottis, which is the opening. So here, these cartilage points here in the larynx and the opening of the vocal cords here, this is the opening to the larynx. So this is considered the glottis, and it's covered by an epiglottis. So epi, remember, is above or upon. So the epiglottis is a flap you can see right here diagonally. So it covers the whole of the larynx. So when you swallow, the larynx moves up, and that closes the um, glottis off by the epiglottis. So the epiglottis really stays stationary, and it's the glottis and the larynx that is moving, which closes off that opening so that food doesn't go into your air passageway, but instead will travel behind it in the food passageway of the esophagus. So it's considered the guardian of the airways. If anything does happen to enter into the larynx, usually that will trigger a cough reflex, which will push out whatever it is that you've swallowed. Next, we have the trachea. The trachea is commonly known as the windpipe. It uh, is just below, inferior to the larynx. It's also lined with ciliated mucosa. So again, uh, those hair-like cells help to sweep, and then the mucosis helps to capture um, bacteria that don't belong. It is characterized by having C-shaped rings reinforcing the trachea. So the trachea is a tube right? It's like a straw here. And the cartilage rings are only on the front side. They don't go all the way around the trachea. Behind the trachea, you have your esophagus. So the esophagus, when a food bolus comes through, my esophagus needs to be able to expand forward, right? So the C cartilage allows it to enter into that tracheal space when you swallow food. So that's why the ring doesn't go all the way around. So it helps keep the trachea open while also allowing the esophagus to expand. Okay, next we have the bronchi. The bronchi descend inferiorly from the trachea. You can see the trachea branch into two, right and left, into uh, the primary bronchi. Then from there you can see the primary bronchi branches again, kind of like a family tree and that would be the secondary bronchi, and they branch again into tertiary bronchi. So this is all part of the conducting zone, just moving air. Below that, they continue to branch into um, the respiratory bronchioles at the very bottom level. This is a rat's lung. You can see the two primary bronchi clearly branching from the center line, and then you can see the smaller and smaller branches that are the bronchioles. So I had taken Wood's metal and poured it into the trachea so the air followed the passageway, or the metal followed the passageway, the air would follow. 
A couple interesting things about the bronchi. One, this is uh, the part of the respiratory system that is affected by asthma. So not only will the muscles surrounding the bronchi squeeze down on the bronchi, but also on the inside of the bronchi, um, there is inflammation, which makes the lumen, the hole on the inside, smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's what's happening also with coronavirus. The um, the coronavirus is affecting the bronchi as well, and it's creating an inflammation interiorly, so it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, so you can understand why that would be harder and harder to breathe. Not only is it creating inflammation on the inside, but with the inflammatory response, there's often leaking of that plasma, right? So it creates an inflammatory liquid, and that's what's building up in the form of pneumonia. The alveoli are at the very end of the bronchioles. So at the terminal bronchioles, the very last ones, you're now in the respiratory zone. So this is where gas exchange takes place. So the exchange of oxygen and CO2 is not happening in the nose or the trachea or in the bronchi. It is only happening in the alveoli. And something super interesting about the alveoli is that if you took them all out and you opened them up, they would cover a tennis court believe it or not. So they're considered tiny air sacs. To me, they look like a bunch of grapes hanging on its branches. So they're a single cell layer thick, which structurally makes them ideal for gas exchange to occur. So here's the lungs as a whole, the bronchi um, branch into the bronchioles and the alveoli and all that is contained within this two and a half pound structure. Notice, um, remember you got to reverse this because you're looking at a mirror image, anatomically correct. This is the right and this is the left. So the right has one, two, three lobes. The left has one, two lobes. So the right is slightly larger than the left and it contains more lobes than the left. It has a chem... A it has a covering, um, the pulmonary pleura, pulmonary referring to lungs, or viscera, which refers to organs, the visceral pleural. Um, so it's covered by this membrane. And then your thoracic cavity, which is your rib cage, also has its own lining um, called the parietal pleura. So there's a space between the two, um, the pleural membrane and the which is on the lungs, and the parietal membrane, which is on the thorax. And like the air pressure there remains negative in order to keep the lungs inflated. It's also filled with a fluid called pleural fluid. It lubricates the lungs and it lowers the surface tension um, that aids in the movement of oxygen and CO2 across the alveolar membrane. This picture is trying to demonstrate those two membranes. So this flap is being pulled off of the lung tissue itself, and then this flap surrounds outside of that and it's connected to the thorax. So when your thorax moves, so does this parietal membrane. So along with these respiratory organs, there's a couple of muscles that play a really big role in breathing. The first is the diaphragm muscle. So you can see this very thin layer of muscle right here. It's skeletal muscle. So the contraction and relaxation occurs the same as skeletal muscle. It separates the abdominal cavity from the chest. So you can see the rib cage here, the lungs here, and then the abdomen down here. So this is our thoracic region, and this is our abdominal region, and the lungs are pretty much sitting on top of that diaphragm, which then is sitting on top of our lung, um, on top of our liver. So it contracts and flattens when you inhale. So when you inhale, this is dome-shaped when it's relaxed, and then when it tightens, it's kind of like a rubber band. You can picture a rubber band is loose when it's relaxed, and when you pull it, tight, it flattens out, which also lowers it. So when you in inhale, it drops down, creates a larger area, and a larger area creates a lower pressure, right? So um, pressure and volume are inversely related. So it creates a vacuum effect, and it would actually pull air into the lungs. And when you exhale, the exact opposite would happen. So when the muscle relaxes, it domes back up. Now it's created a smaller space, so that smaller space has a greater pressure. <sighs> So it's gonna push the air, out, the air out. So here I have um, my fake lungs. So I have a container representing my thoracic cavity, a tube representing the trachea, couple 
lungs represent I'm um, balloons representing the lungs and this plastic um, rubber sheath is representing the diaphragm so watch the lungs as I pull my diaphragm down so you saw how the lungs expanded when it was contracted now it's relaxed and the air is emptied out when I contract my diaphragm the lungs fill with air when I relax my diaphragm the air is pushed out so that is all about physics the other muscles involved with breathing are the intercostals we have a set of internal intercostals inter in between right so costals referring to the ribs so in between the ribs here you see your external intercostals you have another set underlying the ribs and that would be your internal intercostals so when we breathe in our external intercostals contract so they get smaller in between these ribs so what is that going to cause to happen it's going to lift the rib cage up and out so like poofing up your chest so again that's going to aid in that expanding the volume decreasing the pressure creating a suction for air to be pulled inwards and the opposite happens in order to breathe out then the rib cage comes down and in and the internal intercostals are only used like in a forced breathing effort so people uh, with asthma or um, after they just ran a race, there's a lot more heavy movement in the chest because those internal intercostals are having to squeeze the air out. But normally, they're not involved. So this is just showing you um, the relaxed here. And you can see a much smaller space, so a higher pressure. It's going to push air out. That's exhalation. And here, the um, diaphragm is down. The rib cage is up and out. And my lungs are very large. So the volume is increased, the pressure is decreased, air will come in. So I think the best way to practice the anatomy of the respiratory system is simply to draw it out. It's a pathway, it's a sequence of events. Our brain likes pictures. So test yourself. Can you draw all of the structures from the nose until the alveoli? Can you identify the changes in the thoracic cavity during inhalation and exhalation? So be like this little baby monkey I found. Don't let knowledge, knowledge pass you by. You got to reach out and grab it. Thanks for watching.